invite you to take a seat and to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 28 is our text this afternoon. And if you don't have a Bible with you uh, or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 992 and you will find our text. And if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those Bibles with you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, then God will change your life. And so uh, if you don't have one, take one because uh, that's important to us. Hey, uh, happy Easter, by the way. And I know, I, I, thank you. I know some of you are going like, it's not really Easter, it's Saturday. But I'm here to tell you it's actually Easter in Jerusalem. Okay? The place where it all took, it took place in the beginning, it's, uh, it's already early morning there. It's probably not sunrise yet, but it's uh, getting closer. And so uh, they're getting ready to celebrate uh, Easter morning in Jerusalem. We're celebrating just, you know, with them uh, rather than on our time schedule. But I appreciate you guys being here. And, uh, and if you came uh, because you got an, an accidental email this week and you came on Saturday, then that's really, a, we're, we're thankful and we appreciate that uh, tremendously. So thanks very much. Uh, and, and speaking of Jerusalem, I just got to mention this. Uh, some of you might be interested in this, but every uh, three or four years, we take a trip to the Holy Land uh, to visit the places where Jesus walked and taught and that you read about in the Bible. It helps the Bible come alive. And, and if that's on your bucket list, if that's something you've been thinking about and wanting to do, uh, in November of 2020, so a year and a half from now, we're going to be taking another trip. Just got it scheduled. And if you're interested, there are brochures in the, at the Connection Center, the Main Lobby Connection Center. Stop by there after the service, pick one up, you can get the details, the information, and you and God can have a conversation about whether that trip is on your uh, itinerary or not. So, glad that you are here. Want to, want to know, what do you find unbelievable? What is it in your life, in your world, that you find unbelievable? Like, for me personally, I still find it unbelievable that my wife, Merelda, said yes to me. <laughs> yeah, see, some of you are starting to realize that I, there's a reason I believe in miracles. So, uh, yeah, apparently she saw something in me that other people didn't, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, and, and so, uh, I know some of you are going like, oh, I didn't realize that you were the inspiration for Napoleon Dynamite. Yes, I am. Although, in my generation, it was much more of trying to look like Peter Brady. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, hey, I'm unbelievable. Uh, I find it unbelievable she'd marry that guy, but uh, I'm glad she did. I'm also just amazed. It's unbelievable to me that, that God has gifted me with kids and grandkids uh, that I get to enjoy and be a part of their lives. That is such a blessing and so wonderful. And a lot of you know what I'm talking about in that. And, and that's, that's just unbelievable to me. And you know what else is unbelievable? It's unbelievable to me that I get to pastor this church that's in the best city, in the best state, in the best nation on the face of the earth. You know? I, I just look at that and go, that, that is amazing and unbelievable. So what do you find unbelievable? Uh, maybe it's people flying. And by that, I don't mean airplanes and stuff like that. I mean things like that. Yeah, isn't that crazy? All right, secretly, how many of you wish you could do that? Oh, yeah, I see those hands. I'm with you. So let's take out some, a bunch of a life insurance and go learn how to do it. Uh, you know what else is unbelievable? When you stop and think about it, and it's something that probably everybody in this room has, these things are unbelievable. You know, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, and, and a lot of you are like, what's unbelievable? We all have cell phones. We all use them. I mean, you know, think about the, the progression and what has happened with these because there's a lot of us that grew up where your phone was attached to the wall and it had a cord on it. And you could only go so far as the cord. So you were really high tech and fancy if you had the extra long cord that you could stretch around the corner and into your bedroom and shut the door so everybody couldn't listen into your phone calls when you're trying to call a girl. Yep, that's exactly right what I'm talking about. And, and, and the phones had these things on them. <laughs> Rotary dials. Uh, okay, who's with me? Who remembers those days? Okay. What about party lines? Who remembers party lines? You guys are older than me. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I didn't have a party line. I heard about them. You know, the old people were talking about them. But uh, you know what else is unbelievable? 
the American Revolution. I mean, you think about this. If, you, if you're a student of history, I mean, we all celebrate it every 4th of July. We, you know, pledge allegiance. We do all the kind of stuff. We talk about Declaration of Independence. It's amazing history. But when you look back at history and, and the fact that these tiny American colonies were able to rebel and win a war against the greatest empire on the face of the earth at that time, that is unbelievable that these men took the risk that they did to declare independence and then fight for it and win that victory uh, is, is just unbelievable and you know what else people find unbelievable the resurrection of Jesus and I know that technically that's why all of us are here today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus but is it unbelievable Matthew chapter 28 uh, we're going to start reading in verse 1 we're going to skip around a little bit in this uh, brief chapter but Matthew the gospel of Matthew was written by one of the original 12 followers of Jesus, okay? The, what are called the disciples or the apostles. And, and so, uh, you know, he wrote this. He was there with Jesus. He walked the, with him, uh, heard the teachings. Uh, he was actually called from his, you know, tax collector booth uh, to follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me, and he did. This is what he writes. He said, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week. Now, just pause right there. The, the Sabbath happened right after Good Friday. So Jesus was crucified and buried on Friday. And then nobody could do anything because you can't go anywhere on the Sabbath. Everything shut down. And now it's Sunday morning. It says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Skip down to verse 16. Now the eleven disciples, remember that's the original twelve you know, disciples, apostles, and of course Judas wasn't with them because he'd killed himself after betraying Jesus. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Some doubted. I mean, I mean, isn't that amazing that that's in there, that, that the word of God is so honest with us, that Matthew is so honest with us, that here the guys are that followed Jesus. They've been with him for three years. They, they heard his teachings. They watched the miracles. And then they saw him be crucified and buried and, and then they heard about the resurrection, and then we know from the other Gospels, they encountered Jesus face-to-face -face multiple times over the next 40 days after the resurrection. I mean, they ate with him, they traveled with him, they listened to him teach, and, and here they are worshiping him just before he ascends to heaven, and they're still having some doubts. Uh, now, you may wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. You might wholeheartedly believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Or maybe not. Or maybe you're here and you kind of believe it, or you believe it, but you got some doubts, and you want to believe it, but there's some of those questions, and sometimes you're wondering uh, if it's not all unbelievable. Well, I want you to know that Calvary is a place where we welcome questions. We're, we're not afraid of your doubts. We're all on a, on a faith journey, and we want to help you take that next step in following Jesus. And, and if you're struggling with that, just know that you can always ask the questions. And, and what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss some doubts or questions that have been asked of me through the years. Things that people have just said, hey, I, I really... I hate to admit this, but, uh, you know, this is what I'm wondering about. And, and maybe you've thought about them. Maybe you want them answered. Uh, maybe some of your friends have asked these questions. And so I'm going to just acknowledge the questions. I'm going to try to answer them in a very cursory way, very simple way. 
uh, and, and I hope those are satisfactory, but if they're not, if, if you listen today and you're like, yeah, I still have doubts, I still have questions, then, then here's an open invitation for myself and all the pastors of Calvary. We would love to sit with you and try to answer your questions and try to help you to take that next step of faith in following Jesus because we want you to believe and we want to help you to believe. So uh, that's just a, an offer. I'll buy you lunch and you can ask me whatever questions you want and I'll try to answer it. So we're going to answer them real briefly tonight. Just understand that there's a whole lot more in terms of the answer. So here we go. First doubt, first question that I've been asked, and it's simply this, is God real? Is God real? Now, I believe that he is, okay? But maybe you have some doubts. And, and so I'm going to give you my simple uh, answer. Is God real? Two reasons to answer yes, God is real. The first reason is creation. Creation. I mean, look around you. It's amazing. The beauty, the detail, the wonder, right? You guys do get out, don't you? I mean, four-wheeling, on the lake, you're, you're out there boating, you're having a great time, you're hiking, you're doing this kind of stuff. I mean, you see creation, and it is beautiful, it's amazing. The detail, the design. Or, how many of you have ever held a child or a grandchild? Yeah. And you look in their eyes, and you see that, and you see the, the little tiny fingers and toes and all that perfection, and, and it's just amazing that God could do that. And, and, and then you watch them as they grow. I've got two grandchildren under a year right now. And you watch them as they're growing and they're just drinking it all in with their eyes. And, and, and right away they learn disobedience. <laughs> and nobody is teaching them that stuff, right? And you're just watching them practice defiance. of their. It, it's crazy. And, and here's the thing. If you have a creation, logic demands a creator. If you have a creation, then logic demands a creator. And now, if you were raised in church, you were introduced to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The very first verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, God is responsible for everything that exists. And, uh, you know, and so if you're raised in church, that's real easy. But a lot of people want to tell us that God didn't create. And, and they argue from things like evolution. They want to tell us that that uh, because of the age of the earth, because of the Big Bang or whatever, it is, it, that God didn't create it. And, and they think that somehow because uh, of the Genesis account of creation, that that nullifies uh, our faith. And, and, and let me just tell you, uh, it doesn't matter if you believe in a literal six 24-hour days of creation in Genesis or whether you believe the earth is billions of years old. I don't really care. I'm not going to argue how old the earth is because I wasn't there when it was born. And you go, well, are you, you anti-science? No. Are you anti-faith? No. I, I want you to understand that, that Genesis very clearly tells us that God created and he designed it is on purpose. It's not an accident. But here's the reality is I don't really care how God created it, and I don't care how long it took God to create it. And some of you that were raised in church go, well, preacher, what are you saying? You don't believe in six 24-hour literal days? Well, you take them or leave them, but I actually read the Bible. You might want to do that sometime. Because the sun, moon, and stars aren't created in the Genesis account until day four. How do we measure time? Any, anyone? The, the sun. It's kind of important to measuring time, isn't it? The 24-hour day is like the earth traveling around the sun. So I don't, I don't think Genesis is really trying to tell us how long it took God to create. I think it's trying to tell us that God created. It doesn't tell us how God created. Understand, God could have, you know, done it all in one big bang. Okay? Could have made it happen that way. He could have taken his time, billions of years. He could have taken it instantly. He's God. He could do it any way he wants to do it. So I, I don't really care how long it took. I don't care how he did it. I just know that God did it. And the design is amazing. And again, if you have a design, you probably have a designer. Yeah, you do. I, I mean, look, I don't know about you guys, but my junk drawer never produces iPhones on its own. Stuff in there just gets lost and stays in there. There's no order that's happening naturally to it. There's no design taking place. Uh, it, you have somebody else has to clean it out and put it together in that way. So, uh, first reason I think God's real is creation. The second reason I think God is real is because many of us in here know him personally. Uh, there's a lot of people, uh, myself included, that know that God has forgiven my sins. Uh, he's altered my destiny. Uh, he's changed my life. 
And, and honestly, I, I talk to him on a regular basis. And a lot of you talk to God on a regular basis. And, and so, now if there's just one of us that has this God experience, then you can just call him crazy and lock him away. But there are two billion people on the face of the earth right now that identify themselves as Christians. Now, I, I'm under no illusion that all of them have a personal relationship with God, but there's got to be at least hundreds of millions of people who are saying, I have a life-changing experience with the living God, and, and I don't think you have group delusions that large. So, uh, and that's what's happening. Either God is real or we got one heck of a large group delusion going on. So, today, if you're doubting God's existence, first of all, know that you're not alone, because they worship Jesus and some doubted. Uh, but we want you to believe. We really want you to believe. And so, uh, if I challenge you, if you want to believe, but you have your doubts, here's, here's the challenge. I'm just going to challenge you to pray, not just once, but multiple times. You can do it every day or just whenever you want to think about it. But I challenge you to pray a prayer like this. God, reveal yourself to me. God, reveal yourself to me. Show me that you're real. Show me that you, you exist. You know, Jesus said, uh, or excuse me, the, the God said, uh, if you seek me, you'll find me if you seek me with all your heart. So if you're unsure about the reality of God, just ask him to reveal himself. I think he's waiting to do that. He'll open your eyes and he'll change your mind. And, and then the second question or second doubt uh, that, that I've been asked is simply goes like this. Is God good? Is God good? I mean, maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've been hurt badly. Maybe you experienced abuse or you've been betrayed or abandoned. Maybe you've suffered a tragedy, uh, a death, a disease, a disability. Maybe you've witnessed personally intentional evil done by people that you trusted. I, I know in this world you've seen random tragedies and natural disasters and of course, we hear about the poverty and the pain and the disease and the, the birth defects and, you know, widespread genocides and hatred and violence and anger that's taking place. And a lot of people then go, well, if God is real and God created this world, then where is God in the pain and suffering and sorrow? I mean, is God really good? If he's good, then, then why is the world so messed up? Because we know reality, right? We know that we live in a broken world that's filled with pain and suffering and evil and injustice. Why? Well, here's the biblical answer. Okay, going back to Genesis again, that beginning book, God created paradise. Okay, it was a perfect world. Nothing was messed up in it. And, and he put people in it to be in charge of it. And he said, hey, you guys are in charge. They're our ancestors, all of us. And, and so they were in charge, and, and he said, hey, you can do anything you want, take care of this place. There's just one simple rule. Of course, there had to be one stinking rule, right? And it had to be a diet rule. Don't eat that. <laughs> you wonder why you can't diet? Because it runs in the family, all right? <laughs> and of course, they disobeyed. They rebelled. They defied God. They said, no, nope, we're going to do it our way, not your way. And because they disobeyed, everything got messed up. Their relationship with God got messed up. The, the world got messed up. In fact, you know, uh, later on the Apostle Paul said the world groans in anticipation of being fixed. Okay, it's broken. We live in a broken world. It's not what God designed, and we're the ones who broke it. And see, like our ancestors, every single one of us has chosen to break it more. Because we've all rebelled against God. We've all defied God. We said, I'll do it my way, not your way. We've been selfish and self-destructive. And, and, and the Bible calls that sin. The Apostle Paul said that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's, there's hope. Uh, the Apostle Paul later said... Uh, for just as through one man sin entered the world and through sin death, therefore all died because all sinned. You want to know why the world's messed up? It's on us. It's on our ancestors and our choices and the choices of other people in this world. And, and God is going to redeem our world because God is good and God loves us and he loves you. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And, and that God sent his 
only son in this world to be our atoning sacrifice. So Jesus entered into our pain and into our brokenness in order to redeem us from our pain and brokenness. To give us that hope of life. That chance for that new world, that new creation. You know, I don't know if you guys saw their shirts they were wearing in the bap baptistry over here. It said new creation. New creation. That's what they are. That's our hope. That's that what we're aiming for. And, and that's part of the promise of, of God's goodness is that we're going to live someplace one day where there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain or politics. And, uh, and that, see, you guys are like, I want to live there. And so maybe that makes sense to you or maybe not. Maybe it makes sense to you. Maybe it doesn't satisfy. I, I, I know pain and grief make it really difficult for us to see God's goodness. And if that's the case in your life, then, then my prayer challenge is this. I'm going to challenge you to pray on a regular basis a prayer like this. God, help me to see your goodness and your beauty. God, open my eyes to see your goodness and your beauty. Because if you ask God to do that, he, he may surprise you. and He may show you some people around you that are full of grace and mercy and love. He, he may show you some circumstances that could have been a whole lot worse than they are. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's going to surprise you if you ask him to show you his beauty and his goodness. Third question that I've been asked. I could ask this one a whole lot more than the first two, honestly. Can God change my life? Can God really change my life, my story, my relationships, my situation. And honestly, we know God can change your life. I mean, this is why Jesus came into the world to begin with. He came to, to rescue us from death. He came to set us free from this prison of self-destruction that we live in. He came to offer us forgiveness and life and hope. I mean, Jesus said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. You know, this whole religion stuff that, that, you know, tries to confine you and control you is not of God. Jesus came to set you free. We know that because he said, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You're absolutely free. So I can tell you this. The resurrection of Jesus changed the reality for those men we call apostles. Okay, remember there were 12, one betrayed him, died. So there's 11 left. And those 11 men, uh, if you look at that situation, they were with Jesus. They'd been following him for three years. And, and uh, they pledged their undying faithfulness to Jesus. Even if we have to suffer and die with you, we're going to stick with you, Jesus. And what happened? The first guys showed up with swords, and the, and the disciples split. I mean, they just ran away. They're a bunch of cowards, faithless cowards. Peter, who had just, you know, said over and over again, I will never deny you. I will never deny you. Even if I have to die for you. What did he do? Denied him how many times? Three times in one night chicken right I, I mean isn't that you know what we're all going i can't believe you'd do that yeah and then what happened jesus rose from the dead and about two months later those cowards became courageous leaders of this movement that we call the church and they stood face to face with the same men that sentenced jesus to be crucified and they said we have to obey god not you we're not going to stop talking about what we have seen and heard. We can't help it. And, and those guys threaten them with life, and they're like, we don't care. There's no other name given us among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. We're going to preach it. We're going to teach it. We're going to share it. They, they, they just were crazy courageous. And, and, and what changed? Jesus rose from the dead, and now they knew it was true. The Holy Spirit was in them, and they, they knew that they were never going to be the same. See, here at Calvary, we celebrate life change. In fact, our whole mission is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we are witnesses of life change on a weekly basis. We see families healed. You know, I love it when parents and kids or siblings are reconciled to each other. We see addicts find freedom. We, we see marriages reconciled. We see that, that Jesus changes lives. So we know that God can change your life. We don't have any doubts about it. You just have to ask him to. You seriously just have to say, okay, uh, God, I need you to change my life. But, and, and you've got your doubts. You're sitting there going, yeah, but really, is it going to work? 
See, it begins when you trust Jesus to do the unbelievable in your life. And, and so today we're inviting you to trust Jesus to change your life. And, and, and what that looks like is this. It, it means that you acknowledge, hey, I'm a sinner. I've messed things up. I'm not perfect. I can't be good enough to make it to heaven. So I need Jesus to save me. And then you can, you know, you just go, hey, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and was raised from the dead. And, and today I'm committing my life to follow Jesus. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. I'm going to follow him regardless. So that's what they told you in the, in the baptistry. I'm going to follow Jesus the rest of my life. Publicly, unashamedly, they told you that. Now, that doesn't mean you suddenly agree with me or become crazy religious. It means you're asking Jesus to change your life. And it means trusting Jesus to make you a new person. Like those shirts they wore, they're, they're quoting the Apostle Paul who said, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has passed away. All things become new. Everything new. Now, if you're not sure that can happen to you, then pray a prayer like this. This is the challenge prayer. God, give me the faith to follow. God, give me the faith to follow Jesus. I, I, I can't do it without you. I need your help. And, and, and I don't know how to put this. It's got to be more than words. Words are cheap. Words are easy. Words aren't enough. This is not going to be easy. If you say, God, I want you to change my life, and I'm going to do whatever you ask, I'm going to follow you, he's going he's to turn your life upside down. That's what our sermon series is about. Uh, start next week. God's going to challenge you to do some things that you're not comfortable doing. He's going to ask you to go some places you're not comfortable going. He's going to change you, make you a new person. And some of us want that un until God actually asks us to change. This, this isn't easy. It requires faith, and faith is never easy. It is a life-altering decision to confess Jesus as a resurrected king of your life. Um, in fact, it looks a little bit like this. In 1859, there was a, a man named Charles Blondine who decided he was going to tightrope walk across Niagara Falls. And uh, that's a picture from the Smithsonian Magazine. They actually took a picture of him doing this. He stretched a, a two-inch rope 1,300 feet across Niagara Falls, and 25,000 people gathered, about half on the Canadian side, half on the American side, to watch this idiot plunge to his death. Okay, they did. They, they went there, and uh, there are people who were railing against it, and people who are afraid to watch. And, and Blondine walked across uh, the, the tightrope. And then he walked back. And, and then he started doing crazy stuff, like taking pictures and stuff on the way. And, and then he actually pushed a wheelbarrow. And he said on one side, hey, do you guys think I can push the wheelbarrow across? I think it was on the Canadian side. And they all cheered, yeah, we think you can do it. And he pushed it across. He got to the American side, and they're all cheering and everything. He goes, hey, do you guys think that I could put somebody in this and push them across? And they're like, yeah, we think you could do it. <laughs> he said, volunteers? <laughs> yeah, everybody was suddenly silent. It's like, you volunteer, I'm not volunteering. <laughs> See, we can laugh about that, but honestly, this whole faith thing is Jesus basically saying, get in the wheelbarrow. Get in the wheelbarrow. It's not easy to trust God with that step of faith, but God is calling us to trust him, and that's what will change our lives as we grow in faith. And, and whether this is the first time you've ever heard a message about Jesus or you've heard it a thousand times, he is calling you to take that step of faith. He's calling you to get in the wheelbarrow. And it's not really going to be easy, but it's worth it. For some of you, you may sense God's presence and his reality for the first time in your life, and you're going, what, what do I do? What is it, what, what's God calling me to do? He's calling you to trust him and confess him as Savior and Lord. I just talked about what that looks like, what that means, but if you want to talk to someone about that, members of our prayer team are going to be here at the front after the service. They would love to talk with you. I and some of our other pastors are going to be at the Connection Centers and, and just stop by and say, I want to talk to someone about following Jesus because we want you to, to follow Jesus. Take that step of faith. For some of you, that step of faith may mean, hey, I'm going to show back up next week. I mean, you, you literally came today and you said, hey, I'm going to do this, but I'm not planning on going back. And you may sense that God is saying, hey, I want you to show back up and I want you to learn what it means to follow me uh, week in and week out. For some of you, it may mean saying, hey, you know what? I need some help getting over some stuff in my life. It may mean showing up at Celebrate Recovery Monday night at 630 at our McCulloch campus. You know, the, uh, 
Yeah, so there's some people who've already found some freedom. And if you need uh, some freedom, just go find one of the people who was clapping and ask them afterwards about it. Seriously, I mean, it, it, for some of you, it may mean taking that step of faith that you saw tonight, baptism. You, you know you've committed to follow Jesus, but you've never taken that step to declare that to the world, that you're a follower of Jesus. Unashamed proclamation that Christ has changed you. In fact, uh, one of the gentlemen that got baptized tonight, it, last service, he was here, and he's like, I need to get baptized now. He didn't have clothes to change into. He just said, I get wet for Jesus, and I'll go home wet for Jesus. That's, that's cool. And, and, and I think that's awesome. And here's the thing. Some of you are going, yeah, well, I kind of missed it. Guess what? We got three services here tomorrow. We're baptizing in every one of them. We got two services over at McCulloch. It's a whole mile and a half away. We're baptizing there too. So if, you, if God's saying to you, hey, I want you to get baptized, what better day to celebrate your following of Jesus than an Easter Sunday? I'm just saying, if God's nudging you, you ought to do what God is telling you to do, because he wants you and he wants me to take that step of faith, to get in the wheelbarrow. It sounds unbelievable. It sounds crazy. But here's the thing. I know if you do it, Jesus will change your life, and you will have the happiest Easter ever. So I'm praying that you follow Jesus. Let's pray.